Welcome to Truth Be Told. I am your host, Pierre Casongo. Tonight, I have, a, once again, a very special guest. He is a leader in the arts and culture sector and broadcasting industry. With more than 20 years of experience working in several cities and provinces, he has became become an advocate for the importance of feeling uniquely Canadian, the, the Canadians uh, of, uh, te uh, of telling, sorry, the uniquely Canadian uh, cultural stories in a variety of media. He is currently working on completing his MBA in community uh, uh, economic development and has a passion for community building. Hello, listeners and viewers. It is my pleasure to welcome Mark Carnes. Mark, welcome to Truth Be Told. Thanks, Pierre. Nice to be here. Yeah. So, you know, I have to start with this funny anecdote that you once said. You wanted, wanted to be a dinosaur when you were a kid. <laughs> Still do. <laughs> yeah. You know, when, well, one thing about that, like now, now you kind of, uh, you say, you know, uh, yeah, say as a kid, you know, kids have a lot, a lot of imagination. So in a way, do you, uh, yeah, I guess you could say, do you still feel that you still have that big imagination that still the kids still do? <laughs> yeah, I think it depends on the day. Um, <laughs> some days are really tough and very, very ad adulty, um, where I've got to do, you know, big things and think in very sort of, you know, very linear ways. But I think on the, you know, the times when I'm, a little less stressed or a little less focused and when my, my mind's allowed to shift and, and, uh, and to kind of wander, I think I kind of go back to that, that child state. I, you know, I try to find humor in things and find weirdness in things and tell really bad dad jokes. And I think those are all kind of things that, <laughs> that, uh, you know, I think the kids do in a, in a weird way. So, you know, I think, you know, I've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years trying to sort of recapture some of that, that innocence, you know, I think, you know, the, the world got really intense and really tough and really dark for a lot of people and me included. And so, you know, I'm trying to find ways to sort of get back to that, you know, sort of look at the world through different lens is pretty important. So I think sometimes I still think I'm a, I'm a kid at heart and still love dinosaurs. I'm actually wearing dinosaur socks right now. Wait a second. You are a fan of, uh, of funky socks too? Oh yeah. Like I'm, like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> no way. Like I'm taking this off right now. <laughs> I'm gonna take this off. No I'm gonna show you. So I got dinosaur socks right there. Yes, <laughs> a man of after my heart. There you go. Kudos to you. Yes, <laughs> and that is a way to be authentic, man. That's I like right. that. That is <laughs> that is uh, that is amazing. I love that. And you know what? It's uh, and the whole thing about uh, dinosaurs is. Somehow it can be a, a bit of a, a term of endearment because dinosaurs are kind of old school because you know, dinosaur like the old school stuff, you know, like things from the past that were just so cool. Because sometimes I'm, uh, I sometimes see on the internet like. You know, you know, like kids from, you know, like the, that are maybe like Gen Z that will be watching or listening to music from years ago, and they're thinking, "Oh my God, this is amazing!" Like they'll be, you know, they'll be born in like 1997, and they'll be watching a, a video by the Commodores, and they're thinking. Like, how did we not know these guys? Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. I mean, uh, 
it's really there's a lot of data out there right now with sort of the younger generation like they are you know i think our generation was the mixtape generation right like you have 90 minutes to put on your you know your nine favorite songs or whatever it was but this generation now like with whether you like spotify or not one of the amazing things about something like spotify is that you can create playlists and you can discover and you can go wherever you want so there's this younger generation who love, who are discovering classic rock, discovering funk, discovering soul from, from back in the day that, um, you know, wouldn't have happened if we didn't have something like a Spotify or a YouTube music or something like that. So it's an interesting time because I think as much as we love the new and the fresh and the funky and all that stuff, there's still this element of, of, you know, appreciating the old school and where it comes from. And I think that's kind of true no matter mm -hmm. through the history of time, but I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's particularly kind of unique right now because you can open up somebody's playlist and it'll have the Commodores and then it'll have like, you know, uh, Pat Benatar and then it'll have somebody from, you know, like somebody from, from new music to everything in between. It's all over the place. And that's kind of what kind of makes music so cool is it's kind of timeless. Mm, absolutely. Like I'm, for me, I'm like I like you know, rap and hip hop music, but for me, I feel that I must also listen to like R and B and soul in the music because if it wasn't for that music, there would be none of that genre would exist. All the all these producers sample a lot from previous artists you know like all mm -hmm. the you know, jazz artists and you know, the, from the past you like, from the Isley brothers from Earth Wind and Fire from Sonny Rollins uh, uh Art and the and Pepper it, many hip hop art artists sample from from artists from uh, the past and people yeah. need to be uh, aware of that in order to understand the uh, music from the present you have to understand stand and listen to the past yeah oh totally i mean and it's actually even deeper than that right like hip-hop and and rap of right now is mm -hmm. sampling hip hop from 20 years ago, which mm -hmm. is sampling to hip hop from <laughs> the seventies and the sixties. And, uh, you know, it's sampling music from the jazz and R and B and blues and all of that stuff. And, you know, even music back then was pulling, you know, licks and guitar licks from earlier jazz and earlier blues, you know, music is sort of this ever evolving thing, but mm -hmm. there's always a thread right back to the beginning, right? Like, you know, if you even think about bands right now that were influenced by bands in the 90s, were influenced by bands like the Beatles and the Beatles were influenced by blues artists from 30 years before that. Right. So it just keeps mm -hmm. going back and back and back. And that's the kind of cool thing mm -hmm. about it is that even if it changes what it looks like and it sounds like, there's always a tie back to what used to be. No, uh, that you were you have this interest in like all the things in music in and culture, like how much of a role didn't play in into your your life it's a good question um it came to me late in life um music like i remember music very vividly like from being a really young kid i remember i remember listening to my parents records and then i remember getting a tape deck that i would record songs off the radio and then I remember discovering my dad's reel to reel music when he was recording music when he was my age, 30, 40 years earlier. Um, you know, and then I remember hating everything that my parents liked because I was a teenager. Um, and then I remember, you know, like finding friends who loved the same music <laughs> I did. And then like music was like what brought us all together. And then I remember you know, turning that passion into, you know, my twenties, which was like going out all the time, going to bars, going to, going to concerts, going to places where music was being played. Um, and, you know, music becoming very social in my life. It was like what defined what, what a Saturday or a Friday night looked like for me. Um, I didn't want to go and stand up, you know, outside in minus 20 to get into a bar with, playing top 40 music, I wanted to go to the club that was playing this band from the Maritimes who, you know, nobody knew about, but it was super awesome. Um, 
And then I remember my 30s going, I don't want to go out anymore. <laughs> and I also remember being in my 30s and going, man, my parents' music was actually really good and buying a bunch of the records that they used to own. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's sort of, it's always been sort of a part of the a certain phase of my life. Um, you know, the arts and culture side of things for me didn't really kind of hit until university. Um, and it was sort of a natural evolution of my passion for music by getting involved in theater and getting involved with you know, different organizations that were part of, for me, what was about the similarities between, you know, music, which was my social outlet and, okay. you know, theater and other, other art forms as being sort of my cultural outlet was this idea of storytelling. You know, I think you know, art is all about telling a narrative about a time, a place, uh, a person, a situation. And so, you know, that's something that I've always loved about it. And, you know, so that was kind of what, sort of sent me on my direction where I am now, which is working in, you know, a broadcaster, but also a, an organization that champions arts and culture. And I think what behind all of that is just this incredible power to tell our stories and capture a moment in time. And, and you know, I help to tell the story of the storytellers now. I think that's pretty cool. It's kind of a nice, nice place for me to be. I've always even said that with music, it has that ability to express the entire spectrum of emotions mm -hmm. that you know, that one uh, songs could uh, could be bringing back uh, sadness one could be bringing back uh, happiness and mm -hmm. for one it could just paint a very vivid picture so for some it could even bring back the memory of no, of a couple's wedding song, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, we see this all the time at CKUA. Um, you know, we get emails from people saying, you know, you played the song and I stopped in my tracks. I haven't heard it in 30 years. And I remember the last time I heard it. Um, I mean, music, ha it's, you're right. It's emotion, right? It, it doesn't matter what the language is. It doesn't matter what the beat is. It doesn't matter what the rhythm is. There's something about music that just sticks with you. It imprints itself on you. It occupies a different part of your brain. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, think about, you know, go back tens of thousands of years. That's mm -hmm. one of the ways we communicated. We didn't maybe, we didn't necessarily have the ability to articulate our thoughts and our feelings, but we could, we could bang a rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we could, so I, it's always been sort of, I think it's just so ingrained in who we are. And I think that's what I love about it is that, you know, it can, it has that ability to make the hair on the back of your neck stand up or have the ability to remember, you know, a long lost friend. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it's something that we can take solace in too. You know, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's become really clear for me about music during COVID was oh, the God. ability yeah. it had to, we heard this from our listeners every single day, you know, it was, you know, early on in COVID, it was, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen in the world. Like we're being told that the, the end times are coming, oh, yeah. but you're the music that you play and the music that I'm listening to makes me feel okay. Absolutely. And then it was, you know, and then it went into sort of like, I'm lonely. You know, I, I haven't seen my family in three months. I, you know, I live in rural Alberta. I haven't, I haven't spoken to anybody in person in a long time, but mm -hmm. music keeps me company. Yeah. Um, you know, and then it's, you know, I'm stressed out. I've been on zoom calls 40 hours this week and, <laughs> I can't handle it anymore, but I throw on some music and it's my, it's my release. Right. Yeah. So there's something about music that, that transcends anything we can pro possibly process. Mm -hmm. It's about, mm -hmm. about letting our emotions and letting us be okay with our emotions. Yeah. Like one of the, uh, one of the songs I was listening to was actually Love is in Need of Love Today by Stevie with a Wonder. Mm -hmm. And it's off the 1976 album song is in the key of life. Just that the song was actually profound. And I was actually I'll confess I was actually you know just in tears because of, of that song. Yeah. Just the story because you know it, it was just spreading a positive vibe that everyone needed mm -hmm. and another the song that was uh, that was spreading some cheer like uh, saying you know, like hey come on we need to re rebuild 
was Wake Up Everybody by Harold Melvin and the Blue uh, Notes. And that goes again to, uh, to show you that like in the time of COVID, like these songs just offer some solace for people. Cause yeah, like in the uh, in that time, like we were all like it, it we were all so tense, mm. lost, we were scared, just not knowing what to do. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, you know, and I, again, like the songs you brought up are are not new songs. They've been mm-hmm. around for a while. So, you know, it's it's a language that tra- <clears throat> transcends time. It doesn't matter what we're going through. We can, you know, music of any generation or any era can can make us feel better about things. Uh, what I'm curious to see and excited to see is, um, you know, what is the, uh, you know, what what's going to come out of COVID in a couple of years? Because music is also an expression of time. And so I think you're going to see some pretty amazing art come out of not just music, but art in general come out of COVID. Um, and, you know, cause it's a capture of where we've been through in our lives. Um, and I think, you know, some really powerful stories are going to be told and some really powerful songs are going to be created um, either because of COVID or because of what happens after COVID. Yeah. You know, like it could, <laughs> you know, what the, um, <laughs> the funny thing that, my uh, my mother and I have talked about was actually art that was created before uh, uh, the COVID. It was actually the uh, uh, the movie uh, with um, it was actually uh, Matt uh, Matt Damon, uh, Steve, uh, Matt Damon, Lawrence Fishburne. Uh, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, I think it came out around 2012. Mm. Um, Not sure. It was, yeah, and it was talking about some, I think Steven Soderbergh was the, no, well, actually had you know, was the director of the movie, but it was about some viral in the, in the oh, uh, outbreak? No, that no. not outbreak. The other one. There was another one. Outbreak was in 1995. Right, right. Yeah, but there was that. Yeah, I know which one you're talking about now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, that one actually just had a spike in movie in view in 2020 because it's like, oh my god, I uh, didn't. Did the movie director like see this happening? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think in in a way, there's I think the the art that will be seen with with COVID, well, it could even be in a form of comedy because mm-hmm. we're gonna need. I know it's a, it's cliche to see. Comedy is going to be something we and, and we need. It's a major form of relief. Yeah, it's the best way to cut the tension. Yeah, you know it's funny actually. I listened to a lot of comedy during mm-hmm. during COVID. I think that for the same reason, it was the it was a bit of a bit of a break, a bit of a different way of sort of exploring things, um, different way of yeah. To your point, that release that uh, that we all need. You know, I can't be at a good belly laugh. Everyone was wondering, how can we be funny or can we still be funny? Mm-hmm. I think the, then somehow for the comedians that were still going around, they they found a way to, to, uh, to, to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, comedians are you're actually really good at finding, you know, the the bright spots out of pretty dark places so it's not surprising that they did a good job on it but uh yeah i mean it's it, again it's another form of storytelling all right it's how we see the world and it's how we convey the world back in a different way and you also are someone who is, is shaped with all this experience you know just having worked with no with the, the fringe the the symphony, uh, the Edmonton uh, 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 symphony at the Winston uh, uh, Center. Now it's uh, 
uh, radio. And I've heard, I know that you participated at this in the interview at Grant McEwen University. You've mentioned that you have worked with mentors no, no, uh, along the way. How have your mentors uh, helped to uh, to define you and to to, uh, to be kind of uh, help you uh, be authentic? Mm, that's a good question. Um, in a lot of different ways, I think you know I've I've had some really interesting mentors. I've never really had formal mentors. It's not like somebody who you know okay, we're going to spend an hour a week kind of doing things. It's always been people that have just been available to me and and um, help me to sort of work through problems and issues. I think, I think, you know, a good mentor in my experience is somebody who's been able to call me on my BS. Um, you know, we all, we all think we know the answer and sometimes we don't and, and that's okay. And it took me a long time to learn that, that it's okay not to know the answer. I spent a lot of a lot of time mm -hmm. in my career where I was expected to know the answer. Mm -hmm. And it was a mentor who sort of said like, it's actually okay if you don't. Oh my um, God. Isn't it sometimes, uh, uh, isn't it sometimes a relief to just say, just, I don't, I don't know. Like, yeah. Cause sometimes like there's so much pressure for everyone to just know everything. And sometimes you just want to say, I don't know. Yeah. I can try I can try to find out for the moment. It's just I don't know, mm -hmm. but I can find out. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's power in that. When you figure that you can when you figure out that you can say that, that, that that's very empowering. And I think it actually makes you more connected to the person looking for the answer. Um, you know, I think anybody who would appreciate that you go above and beyond to find the answer, um, is somebody worth building a relationship with. Now, if that person sees weakness and not in you not knowing, uh, then maybe you don't want them in your your orbit anyway, right? Um, but yeah, I, I, that was a huge power for me. Um, you know, and that was sort of, that was early on in my career where it was sort of, you know, I've always been in jobs where I, I didn't come in as being an expert in the field. I came in as being somebody who had a willingness to learn and a willingness to understand. I can't play classical music to save my life. I can't read a classical music <laughs> chart. Mm. I can't tell you the, you know, extended works of Bach, but I can tell you who <laughs> knows that. Yeah. Um, and so when I worked for the symphony, it was, it was like, I think part of the reason why I was successful at that job was because I enjoyed figuring out the answer as much as my donors did and as much as my subscribers did. Um, and there's an authenticity in that, that, uh, that can't be beat rather than sort of being the, the expert. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that was always sort of a, a key lesson that I learned. I think one of the, one of the lessons that I learned from mentors is this idea that, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. It matters who you do it with. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've really taken that one to heart. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what the job is per se, but if you enjoy who you're doing it with, if you enjoy the process and and the experience, then that's what matters most. You can take joy and you can take comfort and, you know, find the things that matter to you, even if it's not like the perfect job. You know, I think we're, we're sort of told that there's this perfect career, this perfect reality and, you know, just, just let go and it'll happen. And, I don't necessarily buy into that, but I think you can find places where a lot of that is true um, through yeah, the people absolutely. that you work with. Um, and that allows you to sort of be successful. You know, there's, I'll admit there's days that I don't want to run a radio station, but I enjoy <laughs> the people I work with and I enjoy the people that, you know, that create these amazing programs that we do. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it, it all adds up to a, to an awesome opportunity. What I've noticed is part of CKUA's is like it's you know, diversity in interview you know, topic uh, subject you no know, matter. Like when I was uh, listening uh, to it, like they uh, uh, the the on air personalities would you no know, would even you know, would interview like 
uh, uh, artists like the uh, like Judith Hill, who was supposed to uh, who was supposed to uh, perform with Michael Jackson, but uh, he passed passed away before the This Is It concert. Um, there was uh, 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 there was actually uh, Kristen Scott who was discussing suicide and uh, the, the lost the survivors and you know, even um, again there was uh, I think there was Kathleen McGee one of the comedians and it, that variety is is just it's just great in to being able to kind of adapt and have and be and it shows that CKUA is is not just at addressing one avenue, but it's just it, it goes into different areas. Yeah, I, you know, I think you know we being a uh, you know being a voice for music, arts, and culture, you know, we don't. We're not a we're not a media outlet. We're not CBC. We're not commercial radio. We don't have a newsroom. All of those things. Mm-hmm. What we believe in is the power of music and arts and culture to make our lives a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think what what we've sort of seized on is our hosts are some of the most, uh, some of the best sort of music curators going anywhere in the country they know music better than anybody else their catalog is infinite they're like they're like walking dictionaries and walking encyclopedias of music but we also know that music doesn't exist in a vacuum right like you know right now there's somebody in a pottery studio listening to ckoa because ckoa the music that ckoa puts on it helps them to focus on their work um you know we know that you know alberta ballet is putting on a show about uh, some famous musician this year. We know that, you know, arts or uh, theater companies will do musicals. Like, you know, so music is, is actually the universality in all these different arts for art forms. Um, You know, music is the thing that ties a lot of them together. And so, you know, to sort of use the industry jargon, like the Alberta cultural ecosystem to me, we're the music experts in that ecosystem, but we're also the connector to all these other art forms and all these other different disciplines and different uh, cultures and different experiences. And we can we have the platform to tell that story. So we can take the music and then layer in all these other stories that we do. And that's what kind of creates this cool experience and tells, I think, a really, really compelling narrative of what Alberta is in terms of music and arts and culture. And, you know, it's a very important story to be told from our province. Um, you know, we don't, it's not like there's a lot of media outlets stationed in Alberta with newsrooms in Alberta trying to tell Alberta music, arts, and culture stories. In fact, there's only a couple of them left. And I'd say that we're doing more than the other one in terms of doing that job. So I think that's, you know, we take that very seriously that you know, I think what makes CKOA is unique is that we can be plugged in at a local level and tell those stories and, mm-hmm. and do it with music in as sort of the, the soundtrack for the whole thing. And I think it makes for a pretty, uh, pretty cool experience if I do say so myself. Yeah, it certainly does. And you also like the thing that you love to promote, like the, the culture of in Edmonton, like the, like what's unique about like the culture of a certain place, certain city, like even like what, like even just, so think as simple as just restaurants that you find only in Edmonton or mm-hmm. only in certain in the city, which yeah. <laughs> I'll admit that I uh, that you and I have in common. Yeah, well, I mean, food's another way of telling a story about a community, right? Local mm-hmm. food is is part of the local experience. So, I mean, if you think about it, you know, the farmer that grows the chicken is playing CKOA in the barn and then the, you know, the, the chef buys the chicken and the chef cooks the food and the CKOA uh-huh. is playing in the kitchen, right? So there, there is a lot of that sort of, you know, that's a pretty simplified way of looking at it, but, um, you know, food and music and art and, you know, even sport and recreation is an expression of a community. It's what makes a community... Uh, a place that you fall in love with um, are the, those types of things. You know, we can, 
we can complain about potholes all day long and tax rates and all that stuff. But if we feel like the place we live in is creating a quality of life that we love, mm -hmm. then it's uh, then then we're willing to pay for the potholes and the tax rates because we're getting something out of it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, food's a great example of that. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of different things, you know, it's sort of, but I think it's anything that has to do with what makes the ordinary extra fun. That's what I think makes for a really powerful and a really strong city. And I think what's really interesting about Edmonton is because we're so North and we're so isolated in a lot of ways is that we have to do it ourselves, right? Yeah. We're not, we're not waiting on, we're not waiting on a layover from Vancouver to come spilling into Edmonton to, to, to do things. It's, we've got to make a destination that people want to come to and we, we want to make a city that we're proud of. And so it's kind of up to our own devices and so I think because of that, we do things that are pretty special because mm. that's, it's, you know, if we don't do it ourselves, nobody's going to do it for us. Exactly. You know, like, but a city that has, you know, like all of these great, you know, you know biking trails where, you know, this, uh, the, the city that has the jazz you know, festival, you know, the, the city that has, well, the Louisiana Purchase Restaurant, which, uh, which between you and I, great restaurant. Oh my god! Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've been there. I have. Yeah, I've. I've oh I've had, my god! I've had some catfish in my time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know that the 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 Satisfaction Play was actually named after the Rolling Stones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I think they went. Yeah, they went there. I think what in the ninety seven. Ninety seven. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was the year they opened the Winspear Center and the Rolling Stones booked the rehearsal space in the back of the Winspear Center and nobody was allowed to go in there while they were rehearsing. And then they went in after they, after the Stones had left and the place was just destroyed. They had to, it was just so much smoke. They had to clean all the curtains and like fix the floor <laughs> and clean up all the bottles and stuff. So nice. no surprise there. Oh my God. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, I'm learning a, a little bit of the history uh, uh, there, and you know, everyone uh, is, and that uh, that's just amazing. Mm, yeah, they, I mean, there's, there's lots of history in Edmonton. We just don't tell it very well. We don't tell our story very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. What? And I just wanted to uh, go back to that, uh, just that little no uh, bit about. Being no, no, about no, the no, no, mentorship, you know, like the because uh, we've talked about like you having mentors, but in the, if you if you've had a chance to kind of for, uh, formally or informally mentor other people, what would you say you would like to be be your uh, legacy as? a mentor mm. i don't know i've never really thought about that that's a really good question um what would be my legacy as a mentor i think i think my legacy i think my legacy would be people who have a better appreciation for the world around them you know i think the, the mentors that i worked with well there's two things one, I actually believe the term mentor is a gift. I don't think you can call yourself a mentor. I think somebody has to call you a mentor. Um, it's a gift word. Um, so when I think about, you know, one of the nicest things somebody ever said to me was he called me his mentor and we'd never had a mentoring relationship before. There was never any sort of like, I'm your mentor. You're my mentee. We're going to do this and this and this. It was just somebody who learned a lot from me. And one day he mm -hmm. said that I was his mentor. And that was, that was pretty cool. Like that was, he gave me a gift that I never thought I could receive. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think, you know, so like a legacy f for me, selfishly would be, for more people to think of me like that. Um, not that I'm expecting to be called that, but just to sort of know that that's something that I've had that impact in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I think if there's something that I can impart on some on people, it's um, 
develop an understanding of the world around you. You know, there's the world is such a thing now that you can't be singularly focused on something. Everything is interconnected. And so, you know, whether you're a, an accountant or you're, you know, you're a chef, you know, like the world, it's the world around you that impacts what you do. And if you can take the time to appreciate it and discover it and explore it and understand it, um, knowing that you'll never fully understand it because there's no way you can, but at least if you try to sort of take that opportunity to, to understand the world around you and, you know, sort of how you can maybe play a little bit of a role in, in making it a little bit better. I think that's a, I think that's something that I always want to impart on people around me is, is, you know, be, try to be a, a more rounded individual. Wow. Trying to understand the world around you. That's just in a beautiful, I, mm -hmm. I love uh, that well, perspective. You just got to take it in. There's a lot Absolutely. coming at us at all times. And finally, there are you know, three last things that I do want to, uh, to know uh, from you. What does living your truth mean to you? Man, living your truth. Um, you know, what's funny is I'm actually struggling with that one right now. Um, I'm working on this with this one with my therapist right now, actually. <laughs> um, I, I've lost a little bit of that over the last few years. I think mm -hmm. for me, living my, tr I've lost my, what living my truth means because I've been so intertwined with my job and I've let my job define me rather than me living my truth and letting the job be part of what that is. Um, so I'm really struggling with that one right now. I think, you know, you know, to be, to be philosophical about it, I guess that means that living your truth is recognizing that living your truth is a constant process. Um, but I think for me, it's, you know, it's, it's recognizing where you are and, understanding where you're going want to go but also being okay that you don't know how to get there i think that's sort of you know at the end of the day i don't think most of us know what the path in front of us is and so living your truth is sort of being open to discovering that path as you go so it's like an you know, ever uh, ever grow ever going growth huh yeah. Uh, yeah. A little bit of growth, but also sometimes it's okay not to grow. Sometimes mm -hmm. I think it's okay just to kind of like stay where you are and, and spend some time on where that is before you go. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's the conversation I've been having a lot with my therapist right now is, yeah. you know, I was constantly growing and changing direction and changing direction that I never really figured out who I was. Mm -hmm. um, I was constantly sort of recreating myself and reinventing myself just by virtue mm -hmm. of where my life was taking me. And so now I'm in this point where I'm like, I don't really know who I am. So my mm -hmm. truth is to be discovered. Yeah. All right. And the second question, how would living your truth and being authentic make you a better person? Mm. Um. Well, I think, I think, you know, being authentic, living, living your truth, I think it makes you a better person because you're straight up with people. And I don't mean that in the like point blank kind of way, but I think in the way of when you speak, you speak from a place of, of understanding when you listen, you're listening with both ears and with full intent, you know, that to me, that's authenticity. It's that, it, that it's that ability to connect with somebody without any pretense. Um, and so I think for me, that's a, that's a, that's a thing that I always try to sort of deal with is, you know, we always, we all, we all put on a bit of a facade, right. When we're dealing with people we don't know, or dealing with the outside world, or even with people we know really well, there's always a little bit of a facade. So I think, you know, sort of breaking down that barrier and and trying to find those 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 connection points that aren't sort of forged through some sort of falseness and i think you know that's a it's a very lofty lofty comment and a lofty experience but i think it's pretty true i think you know for me being authentic is knowing that i can that i don't have to be perfect which for me is a really hard challenge uh for my own self esteem 
And last but not least, what advice would you give to someone looking to embrace who they are? Mm. Um, do the one thing that I don't do. Um, take a lot of time to stop and reflect. I think there's a lot, a lot to be learned from, mm -hmm. you know, stopping the hamster wheel that we're all on and kind of going, 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 and just taking that time very deliberately to just stop and, you know, question the world a little bit and, and, um, you know, and, and to sort of really think about who you are and who you want to be and, and, and that type of thing. It's, uh, yeah, as I said, like that's, that's the journey I'm on right now is to kind of figure that out. So, um, but I think it's different for everybody. That's what it is for me. I think for some people, it's some people that just know exactly what it is supposed to be and that that's what they need. And, but for me, I think it's, it's okay to be living in a little bit of ambiguity. Um, I think that's what allows you to sort of figure out the trail that's hidden inside the the fog. Words of wisdom from Martin Carnes. <laughs> you can, uh, if you go to www.ckua.com, you can find different ways to stream a radio from your computer or from your uh, from your uh, from your uh, your phone. You can even find uh, diff info about how to uh, on, about their personalities, and you can follow up. Follow CK the UA through social media. Mark, it has been a pleasure to have you on today's show. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for reaching out. And to you, the listeners and viewers, thank you so much for being here. And remember, stay true.